early released because my health was in such rapid decline that I couldn't wait for the system to catch up to me. I recognized that I'd be leaving benefits kind of on the table, but I couldn't afford to stay. So after my release, I immediately began to notice the effects of withdrawal and isolation. So I decided to get a motorcycle and like any sane person, ride all over Canada and share what I was going through, you know, both so I could start the healing process and in the hopes that would help others. Uh, that has since evolved into the Dispatches Adventure Ride and Speaking Tour, which kicks off at the end of May. And I can honestly say doing that ride saved my life more than once. And today I want to share a bit about that journey from, from diagnosis to that, that healing journey with you. So here in March of 2000, sorry, 2001, and it wasn't long before I started to notice that things weren't going well at home. Uh, my wife and I, at the time, and I had started to see a marriage counselor uh, to try and work things out. And one evening we had friends over for dinner. And one of them asked me, hey, did anything crazy happen over in Africa while you were there? You know, and I thought, and I replied, no, not really. You know, it was quite a few months. Um, and, then, and then something occurred to me, something happened in a place called Assad. So, this one morning, uh, we had been out watching the, the Ethiopian lines for the night. So we had another uh, another uh, section on the other side. And I just got out of the Coyote, the reconnaissance vehicle we were manning. And it was just coming daylight. And I thought, you know, before the day shift arrives, I'm just going to sit down and read for a bit. And uh, so I decided to sit down and just prop my back against the, the tire of the vehicle. And I was there for a little while until suddenly I heard two soldiers, two Eritrean soldiers shouting in uh, Tigrinyan. Of course, I, I can't speak the language, so I wasn't sure what they were what they were yelling at, but they both had rifles. So I jumped up, thinking, not really knowing what's going on, grabbed my weapon, and pretty quickly realized that they're actually waving me away from the vehicle. And so I stood up. And as I turned around and looked back, I saw a snake slither away from, from where I was sitting. And the snake was probably about this long. It, it really wasn't that big. Uh, but these two Eritrean soldiers each grabbed a handful of stones and they started throwing at the snake until they managed to, uh, one of them managed to hit its stomach. And from there, another one of the soldiers picked up this massive rock and hoisted it over his head and threw it down on the snake. And the only thing I can liken it to is hitting a finished nail with a sledgehammer. Like it seemed like such overkill. So this thing was very dead. And uh, one of them grabbed his rifle. He grabbed it by the butt so he could hold it as far away from it as possible, scooped the snake up and walked off. Wanted nothing to do with that, even though it was dead. Um, so I just thanked him um, as best I could grabbed a folding chair, sat down, continued reading because sitting on the ground seemed like a bad idea. Uh, what I found out later, uh, sometime later that day, is that snake was a black mamba. Uh, so had that snake bitten me, I would have had between 15 and 45 minutes uh, before the venom started to take full effect. And we were now in the country. So the odds are very likely that I would have been looking at seven to 15 hours of excruciating pain before I died. So that's the story I told them. And it's at this point, some four or five months after the event, that I finally realized how serious that situation was. Um, and I actually experienced what would be an appropriate response. Um, you know, my guts took a twist. I could just feel adrenaline being pumped into my body, you know, cold flashes on my skin. And, you know, in, in addition to all that, my wife was upset. You know, how could something like that happen to you? And you don't share it with me. Well, it's because I immediately forgot about it. It was the talk of the camp for the afternoon. And then we just carried on doing what we do. So the next session with the marriage counselor, I brought it up. I told the story of the dinner party and the snake, and I mentioned how I forgot about it. 
I said, that's it's kind of weird. It's funny, right? And, uh, you know, she looked pretty serious. She said, I'm actually going to refer you to another colleague. And from there, I ended up going to, uh, to Halifax to see a uh, Canadian Air Force psychiatrist. And that's how, at 24 years old, I was diagnosed with an operational stress injury with post-traumatic stress disorder, major depressive disorder, and adjustment disorder. So that diagnosis of PTSD hit me hard. You know, I'm thinking it's 2001, I have PTSD. How many guys do I know who are diagnosed with PTSD? And the answer is none because they weren't here. In 2001, if you were diagnosed with PTSD, you were almost surely on your way out of the forces. Um, I was a young soldier, loved my job. Uh, I'd really only just started my career and I was afraid that it was already over. Uh, I also had a young family that I had to provide for and no idea how I would do it. So I couldn't hide the fact that I was diagnosed with PTSD, but I figured out very quickly I could control how it was seen. So I started to manage it very carefully. I scheduled my appointments so that they were the first thing in the morning, the end of the day, or over my lunch hour. They had minimum impact on work. Uh, I'd openly share that I had PTSD. I would take time when I needed it, but I was very careful about not taking so much time that, you know, it, again, it really disrupted work or, or anybody really took notice. And that combination of being just open and honest enough to take the time I needed and balancing that by being the hardest working soldier in my sector platoon when I was there, um, basically allowed me to hide in plain sight for, for almost two decades. I went to all my appointments. I spoke to my care providers about all the challenges I faced recently. I told them in a very calm and logical way all the things I did to manage those challenges. I sought advice on what to do with other challenges presented. I followed that advice. I discussed medication options. Uh, one thing I was very careful to do was to avoid talking too much about the past or talking about emotions, because I knew once I did that, that image of you know, a soldier who has problems with managing very superbly was gonna come apart really quick. And it worked. At one point, I remember speaking to the unit medical officer and he's flat out said, I can't believe that you have PTSD. You're the life of the party. You always seem happy. You're always cracking jokes and you're always working hard. Um, so this image of, of wellness was maintained at work, but at home, things are very different. Um, things are really falling apart. My relationship with my wife was disintegrating. My relationship with my kids was becoming more and more strained because I couldn't hold my temper. I couldn't parent. And my relationships with family and friends um, were in, nearby were just wilting through, you know, distance and simple neglect. I struggled with addiction. I was irritable, withdrawn, depressed, angry. Everyone in the house was walking on eggshells, trying not to set me off. Uh, but what was worse than, than all that for me was the emotional numbing. Uh, there were many times where the only emotion I could feel was anger or I'd feel nothing. And I can't describe what it's like to embrace your child or your partner and you know that you love them, but you can't feel anything. And you know, in those moments, all you're doing is hoping they can't feel that. So those belts of numbness could last hours, they could last days, they could last weeks. I could feel things work though. You know, I was either happy and jovial, excited or angry. And that was especially true if I was on deployment or if I was involved in training. So when you have the choice of feeling nothing or angry or, you know, feeling these other emotions, you're going to want to feel those things. So I became a workaholic. Uh, any chance I could be away, I was away. And it felt better to miss my family and love them from afar 
than it did to be with them and only feel angry or numb. So being a workaholic also reinforced that image at work that everything was well, and I'm an invaluable part of the team. So eventually that first marriage ended. Um, before long, I was in another relationship and that was definitely a pattern. Um, my second wife was very different than my first wife. And so I naturally expected there'd be different outcomes, but they did share one distinct trait that pretty much all the partners after that shared as well. They were all experiencing or hadn't experienced conflict with an abusive ex-partner and especially conflict over custody of children. And that's what I call my, my white knight stage. And that's actually, uh, coping mechanism that would dominate my personal relationships, my career for many years after that, right up until I released. So in relationships, it was always the damsel in distress I was, I was drawn to. At work, it was about looking after the soldiers I led. Uh, in reality, all I was doing was projecting all my energy and focus outward to other people's problems, so I didn't have to look inward and deal with mine. And the other ugly side of that white knight syndrome, other than denying my own emotions and my own issues, was what it did to my partners. So looking back, you know, if every time your partner has a problem and you gallop in on your on your steed and you know take over, um, there's going to be issues. And it wasn't like I was saying, oh, you're having this problem. Let me help you with it. We can take this on as a team. I just had to come in and say, okay, out of the way, I'll handle this. I've got it. And really what I was doing was I was stripping away their agency. I was stripping away their, uh, the ownership of their own life. And then whether they realize it or not, you know, th those are some pretty serious boundary issues. And people are going to push back on you. It's going to build resentment. And eventually they they push back. And then I'd be stunned because can't you see how much I love you? You know, can't you see how much I'm trying to do for you? Why are you attacking me? And that pattern continued and that intensified over the rest of my career and the rest of my relationships. Uh, I'd go from one relationship to the next and be completely baffled as to why I kept ending up in the same place. And I just couldn't break out of that cycle. Eventually, I decided to change trades. Uh, I love the infantry, but I thought, you know, it's time for something new. Um, I love photography. I actually took the photography program here at Georgian. There's a plug for you guys. Uh, you know, so I wanted to explore that. And I thought, well, why not leave the infantry and become an infantry technician? Um, I told myself that after infantry training as a reservist and as in the regular force, after my primary leadership qualification infantry, which is a notoriously intense course, um, three deployments, who knows how many death marches and sleeping in swamps and, you know, combat patrols, all these other things, being an image tech would be easy. And I wasn't entirely wrong. The job, the training I found quite easy, but the cultural change was anything but. Uh, I really failed to adapt my thinking, and mainly the idea that everything you do carries a consequence of life or death. And, you know, in an operational environment, in an infantry environment, those little things can carry severe consequences. Um, but I just wasn't able to make that distinction that I wasn't in that environment anymore. Um, so I got to be really stressed out whenever people weren't kind of behaving in the way I was accustomed to. Uh, I wasn't able to connect with my new peers the way I was able to with my brothers and sisters in the combat arms. So I felt alone. I felt misunderstood. Uh, I missed the physical and mental challenges. I was just a part of everyday life in the infantry and work felt really unfulfilling. It felt meaningless. 
And with that, that carefully crafted image of wellness that I had been honing over time uh, began to unravel very, very quickly. And I failed to realize that all my coping mechanisms were tailored specifically to that infantry culture and environment. So rather than being able to examine those perceptions, challenge and change those perceptions, I simply looked at all the things happening around me that were wrong by those old standards and determined, well, everybody else is the problem. It's not me. Uh, things keep, kept getting worse and worse. Um, again, with that white knight syndrome, everything was a battle for me to fight, change the world. And I just became less and less able to see things objectively. Uh, the things I was upset about were legitimate issues. And some of them are, are some of the issues you hear about now. But I was stuck in this very black and white thinking. And if I brought an issue forward to my chain of command and they didn't drop everything they were doing and address that issue right now, I dismissed them as part of the problem. It was just so, so kind of combative about it. Um, there was a term I picked up somewhere in the last few years. And as soon as I heard it, I said, this is, this was me. I fought my way out of influence. I was trying to do the right thing, but I was so heavy handed about it that I just ended up putting a corner. I wasn't wrong in being upset, but I was just so disproportionately angry and so deeply entrenched in those beliefs that it was no doubt impossible for anybody to deal with me. Um, and in my mind, that same thing, I'm just out here trying to do the right thing. Why am I the bad guy? Um, so the time finally comes after 17 years of first being diagnosed with PTSD that I thought I reached my breaking point. Um, I went to the base hospital for sick parades, kind of like going to emerge. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I just knew that I had to talk to somebody. I had to do something. So instead of seeing my usual medical officer, I ended up seeing this very attractive Lieutenant Navy. And I make that distinction because I'm a dude and you know what guys are like in the presence of a woman they find attractive. And I saw her and said, no, I'm not going to say a word. I'm going to pretend I'm here for like a medication refill and I'm going to get out of here. So she asked what brought me in today. And imagine my surprise when tears started to just pour down my face. And I said, I can't do this anymore. So that was it. 17 years fighting to keep how much I struggled under wraps. Just like that, it was out. All I ever wanted to be was a soldier. All I had left in life was being a soldier. And I ended it with those five words. So that was how my, my release process began. And Initially, I felt a sense of relief. I didn't have to keep up these appearances anymore. Um, but that was pretty short lived. I had a year left in uniform, and that last year uh, was what really almost took me to the breaking point. I had struggled with suicidal ideation when I returned from Afghanistan in 2008. Um, and for me, suicidal thoughts was like having a song you hate stuck in your head. You know, you don't like the song, you don't want to hear it, but it just doesn't stop. And while I never got as far as coming up with a detailed plan, um, it was almost like there was a never ending slideshow in my head of, you know, methods I could use uh, to end my life. When I was driving, how can I cause a single car accident? The river's here, it's February. It's frozen, it's not frozen enough to hold my car, but if I could get under the ice, nobody's gonna get to me in time. As I'm washing the dishes, I'm washing the old cooking knives, thinking about, yeah, that'll, that'll do the job. And that just so on and so on with everything. So I got through it the way I used to get through running. Now to look at me, you'd think I run like a gazelle, right? <laughs> I'm here to tell you that's not true. Um, if you've ever struggled with running or you know, you're just starting, one technique I used to use was landmarks. 
I would be running along, wanting to quit. And I'd say, okay, I'm going to run to that tree. And when I get to that tree, I'll walk. And then when I get to that tree, I say, okay, I'm going to run to that signpost. And you just keep doing that until you're finished. And that was how I managed those suicidal thoughts for that first couple of weeks. I said, okay, you know what? I need to make supper and get the kids fed. So I'll do that. And after I'm done that, I'll think about how to kill myself. You know, once supper's done, the kid needs a bath. The kids need a bath. They need to go to bed. Well, I'll think about it after they go to bed. And that's what I did for two or three weeks just to get by. Uh, eventually, I went to see my doctor or the mental health nurse. Uh, I informed a friend in the chain of command what was going on. And, and I took some time to get past it. And a few weeks later, I was back to doing what I love to do, what I was doing all along. Pretended to be, you know, good to go, Mike. Everything's fine. So that was probably the biggest, the most immediate struggle um, that I had with suicidal ideation, but uh, it's not the last by any means. Uh, it came again in 2018, just as I was about to leave the forces and just after I struggled with it um, before I went on my first ride. Uh, it came up in 2019. Uh, just days after I finished my second ride, when I came home to find out I had just lost another friend to suicide. And what got me over at that time uh, was the fact that if I committed suicide after spending two years speaking out against it, I'd be a hypocrite. And it was great that clinging to that value got me through it, but it also highlighted the fact there were no close relationships. There was no thinking of, you know, what do this do to my kids, my family? Um, it really highlighted the fact that of how alone I was in the world. And, you know, all my close relationships were gone, uh, either through estrangement, geographic distance, both. Um, you know, all the people that I worked with and was close to in that way were all dispersed all over Canada. So I knew I had to invest in, you know, starting to build and maintain relationships. And the last time I felt that depth of despair that leads to those suicidal thoughts was last December, just with the pandemic wearing on me. And it's so disheartening because you feel like, I already, I already beat this. I've already been through this. Why does this keep coming back? Um, but honestly, I think, you know, for me at least, once my brain identified suicide as a possible course of action when I'm struggling, I think it's just, it's it's in the Rolodex and it's gonna come up the next time you struggle enough. Um, so I've just kind of accepted that this is something I'm gonna have to be aware of for the rest of my life and be prepared to address as soon as I see any any indication that, that those feelings are coming on. Um, the good thing is that every time I've experienced it, I build more self-awareness and I strive to recognize that pattern as soon as I possibly can. And it's recognizing patterns that's been a huge part of healing. And I'll, I'll speak a bit more about that uh, in a bit. So going back to April 2018, uh, I'm now a civilian. My entire adult life, I was in the forces. So I'm very much the fish out of water. Um, I knew before leaving that if I didn't have a plan, I wasn't going to make it, so I had uh, been accepted to start school in September. So at least I had that. I moved to Simcoe, Ontario, not not Lake Simcoe, down by uh, down towards Brantford. Don't worry, I hadn't heard of it either. Um, <laughs> everybody always thinks I mean Barry. Um, I found a nice, quite like a beautiful spot. I rented a, a home uh, 11 kilometers from campus. I could not be set up better, but. There were a lot of blank squares in the calendar between September and or May and September. And I'm in a strange town. I'm living alone with no friends or family nearby. Um, so it didn't take me long to figure out if I didn't find something to do. I wasn't going to go to school in September. I knew that would end very badly. So that's the point where I got the idea to buy a motorcycle and tour Canada. And I wrestled with that decision a bit. I wasn't in the greatest financial health and I really struggled with, you know, do, do I spend this money and do this? 
Um, but I also understood that this was probably a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and I'd forever regret not taking that chance and experiencing that. And when I considered the alternative, it, it was essentially a no brainer. Uh, I did recognize that simply playing tourist and traveling across Canada, while it would be an amazing experience, would just be avoiding my problems again, I'd just be running from it. Um, so I wanted to do more than just, just play tourist. Uh, I decided to start, start sharing my experiences with PTSD and what I was experiencing in transition. Uh, and that, that decision really set the tone for how I approached my transition to civilian life and mental health moving forward. Um, I look at it as it was the end of managing PTSD and the beginning of treatment, finally, after almost 20 years. And yeah, the ride came with, you know, all sorts of adventure, epiphanies, insights. Um, but it's really that shift in thinking that's that's been most impactful. In September, I started school. I started therapy with a brand new psychologist. And in one of our early appointments, I went in and I told her about that, that minimizing strategy I'd been using for 17 years. And basically told her not to let me get away with it. And not that she needed me to tell her how to do her job, but I just really needed to out it so she didn't have to, you know, she could call me on it immediately. I was just done with that. Um, I worked with a life coach and we collectively decided my coach would handle the day to day. I went to the grocery store today and experienced this kind of stuff. So that when I went in to see that psychologist for an hour or two hours a week, we could actually focus on emotions and root causes instead of wasting that time talking about what I struggled with in the last week. And, and that, along with that experience of that ride, really spurred that healing um, early on. Uh, I worked hard on getting my medications right. Um, I don't know I'll ever be able to go without medication, but I also know I don't want to be medicated to the point where I'm a zombie. Um, I started looking into cannabis treatment to see if that was a fit, if it would give me some of the benefits with the side effects. Um, I started looking to ketamine therapy. There's another therapy with um, beta blockers and cognitive behavioral therapy paired. So, uh, you know, I started to build a peer support network, uh, made sure to build and maintain relationships, not just in the veteran community, but outside of it as well. Um, Really, it was about just finding as many tools as I could to kind of pack into that survival kit. So once I was putting in the work and had supports in place, I found that I started to appreciate the challenges that I would face as I interacted with the outside world. So rather than always wanting to withdraw and avoid uncomfortable situations or reminders, um, I began to thrive off the insights I've gained from them. And that's when I started to be able to recognize those patterns and start picking them apart. Um, one pattern that's deeply affected me is anniversaries. Uh, I'm very sensitive to the time of year and that, that coincides with traumatic or significant events. And during those times, I could run down a checklist of what I was going to struggle with. Depression, uh, random but very frequent bouts of intense grief struggles with addiction, irritability, withdrawal from those around me. I'd either have no appetite or I'd eat constantly. I wouldn't be able to sleep or I wouldn't be able to wake up one or the other, um, just to name a few. Uh, and unfortunately, a whole bunch of nasty anniversaries coincide with a day I simply can't avoid or ignore. And that was my birthday. So for March 31st, which is the day before my birthday, to the 8th of April, there's a five events that will, will cause me to slide. And I'll, I'll share them in order of the, the calendar days they fall on. Um, so March 31st is the birthday of a girl named Kennedy Corrigan. And she was my next door neighbor's daughter. In 2004, she would have just turned two years old. 
And then April 1st, my birthday the next day, on April 2nd, Kennedy's mother's boyfriend carried an unconscious Kennedy over to my home asking for help. Uh, I performed a first aid at good and called 911. Now he had said she'd slipped in the tub and she fell in the tub and hit her head. Uh, but uh, the doctors and medical examiners basically determined that she would have had to have fallen two stories to sustain the injuries that she had to account for those injuries. So it's obvious that he, he did something to her. On April 2nd, 2018, I released from Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, retirement should be a happy occasion, but I wasn't ready to leave. I didn't want to leave. I just knew I had to. And on April 2nd, 2019, I lost a soldier that I had put through basic infantry qualification. Um, we didn't lose him to suicide per se, um, but it was kind of the culmination of a lot of his struggles and self-destructive behavior that that ended that resulted in his death. Uh, on April 8th, 2007, Easter Sunday, I lost a friend named Donnie Lucas and five other soldiers to an improvised explosive device in Afghanistan. And April 8th is also the day in 2004 that Kennedy was removed from life support. So she, uh, she passed away at two years and eight days old. So this pattern of start struggling around my birthday started in 2004 and was just built upon by all these other experiences over the years. And for a long time, I simply did not realize what happened every April. Um, then as I did become aware, I began to try and avoid any reminders. I didn't celebrate my birthday. Uh, I made sure that information was hidden on social media so people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't point it out. Uh, because every time somebody wished me happy birthday, it destroyed me. In 2020, I decided to start taking that date back. Uh, I started by making my birthday public on social media. So I'd be forced to deal with the emotions that arose as people got in touch. Uh, being a pandemic, I was stuck at home, so I baked myself a cake, made a day of it, ate the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, I celebrated with my partner, and you know that that meant something because I was letting somebody else into that day. And this year, right in the midst of it, we're right in the middle of that week. It's the first time I'm speaking publicly about it. So let's be clear, <laughs> it sucks. Um, I've honestly been dreading this for weeks, which is always the good indicator that it's something you need to, need to address. So this year, it, it means that I have to experience the feelings of guilt and failure that I couldn't do more to save Kennedy. I mean, <laughs> it means that I have to identify or acknowledge the sanctuary trauma and how, of how my release was handled by the Canadian Air Forces and the loss of identity I still experience around not being a soldier. It means I have to grapple with the thought that Maybe I could have used my influence with a soldier I trained to keep him from experiencing the struggles that I do. And I have to acknowledge the disappointment about the hope that I had that things would be better for him. Uh, I have to face the guilt of being here in Canada on my friends and comrades who are dying in Afghanistan that April. And I have to face the guilt of having forgotten about what happened to Kennedy for 10 years, it just blocked from memory. I know that forgetting it is how my mind protected me from it, but it's, it's still hard to come to terms with that. Um, mostly I have to experience the feelings that come up when people reach out and express their love and appreciation for me on my birthday. And the biggest feeling that comes whenever anybody says happy birthday is sadness. Um, 
have a hard time dealing with expressions of love or praise um, because they hurt. Because they challenge these very deep rooted uh, beliefs and perceptions I have about myself that I built over several years that were sometimes reinforced by the people I did allow to be close to me. And those feelings are that I'm worthless, I'm broken, I'm unlovable, undeserving of love, happiness, and a good life. And as much as all that hurts, as much as I know it's going to hurt, opening myself up to those experiences and those feelings lets me know where I need to focus that work. Because anything that's still activating or upsetting is something that needs to be addressed. So it really directs that healing process for me. And that's one of the things that was very tough through the pandemic, not having those interactions and not having that, that stimulation to work with. So I bring up the idea of anniversaries because that's what I come up against often. Um, but speaking to a lot of first responder friends, and I know we've, we've got some first responder classes here, one thing they tend to come up against is landmarks. Because um, they often live and they serve in the same communities they live in. So they are, they're more likely to associate places sometimes with incidents rather than dates. Uh, I was recently speaking with a friend who told me about driving with his wife and how he kept becoming more and more agitated as they were driving down this road and, and he couldn't, he didn't know why. Suddenly they reached a point uh, that for him it's becoming almost unbearable and then the feelings just disappeared. You know, thought that was weird. He looked back and what he realized was the road they were on went past the site of an incident that impacted him deeply. It still stuck with him. And as they got close to that location, he just kept getting more and more amped up. And once they were past it, that pressure just released. So just like me, he recognized that pattern. And once you recognize those patterns, you can start to anticipate them. And once you can anticipate them rather than sneaking up on you and surprising you in a nasty way, you can start to approach them with intention and start healing from it. Just like I'm now talking about that, that week around my birthday. And all that's pretty heavy stuff, um, but that's the work of healing. You know, I've often kind of thought managing PTSD and minimizing it is so much less less effort day to day than healing. Until it isn't. Because um, eventually you're going to hit a wall. And after a while, those hits get harder and you're going to hit a wall that's hard enough to kill you. So healing is more work day to day until it isn't. And instead of hitting walls, you find these moments where you can be at peace, you can be happy. And the idea then is to stretch those moments into hours, into days into weeks. Um, I'm left picking up the pieces after 20 years of minimization and re-injury. Uh, there's a lot of people in my boat, um, but the hope in doing this is, you know, helps them find their way and, and the folks who are coming after us, the folks who are just starting their career, if it, if it starts those conversations for them and normalizes them, they can deal with these things along the way instead of having to wait to the end of their career to do it like I did. So I'm very much at the beginning of that heavy work, um, but it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, I found new purpose and passion in what I do with, with dispatches. Uh, I'm discovering that I have an identity that's not completely tied to who I am as a professional. Um, I've learned what it was I was bringing to those relationships that was causing the same outcomes over and over. And you know, I've now built a strong, very healthy relationship with an incredible woman. I have a home that's calm, safe, stable. Uh, I'm part of an incredible team at Project Enlist Canada and Concussion Legacy Foundation Canada. And I know I'm doing work that is going to have a huge positive impact for people like me and just people in general. So I've got that fulfillment and that rewarding um, career coming back to me. Mostly every day I'm learning more and more to love and care for myself, to be accepting my faults and limitations, 
and to be more open and honest with myself and other people. So I said at the beginning that doing the ride across Canada saved my life, and it did. But looking back, it's something else that has really saved me the whole way along, and that's speaking up. So speaking out when I noticed that memory gap with that snake, um, that brought awareness to my PTSD instead of letting it just grow completely unchecked. I credit that with, with where I am today. Speaking out when I struggled with suicidal thoughts in 2008 allowed me to work through it that first time and, and just start to collect the tools I needed to deal with that. Speaking up when I couldn't continue to be a part of the armed forces, even though that's probably one of the most difficult things I ever did. Uh, speaking up when I felt so alone after release and speaking often about the struggles of healing from trauma. That's really what saved my life. And the one thing I hope that people could take away from my story. It's that you're not alone in your struggles and despite feeling that way because PTSD is a bully. What do bullies do? They make you feel like you're alone, like you're worthless. Um, you're certainly, certainly not alone. And if you can find the courage to speak up. There are lots of people who care, who will answer. And if you can do that early on in those struggles, you're so much ahead of the game, so much further ahead than I am. Um, so I'd like to thank the team here at Georgian and Jenny for, uh, for inviting me to share that story with you guys today. Uh, and thank you all for joining. Uh, if anyone has any questions or Anything they want to share? Um, we're we're going to have a Q and A period here. Uh, 